Amen, amen, and amen. If you would turn with me, your Bible, to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. There's 40 verses in chapter 14. What we're going to do is we're going to break it down into part 1 and part 2. Today we'll do 20 verses. Next week we'll do 20 verses. And that will conclude our study on charismatic chaos, the gifts of the, 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 the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 1. And it reads this way. Follow after charity and desire spiritual. You see the word gift there is italicized. That means that it is not in the original King James Version, and not in the original Septuagint. King, J King James put it there for our understanding. So it will read, follow after charity and desire spiritual. Gifts were there to give us understanding, but rather that he may prophesy, for he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God, for no man understandeth him. There you go again, italicized. Howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries, but he that prophesy speaketh unto men to edification and exaltation and comfort. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifies himself, but but be not prophesied edifies the church. Verse five says, "I would that ye all spake with tongues, but rather ye prophesy." For greater is he that prophesied than he that speaketh in tongues, except he interpret that the church may be, that the church may receive edification, edifying. Now, brother, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine? And even things without life giving sounds, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sound. How shall it be known what is piped or harp? For if the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself for the battle? Question. So likewise, ye accept ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood. How shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. There are, it may be so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian. And he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. Even so, ye, for, so, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, speak that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. Wherefore, let him that speaketh in the unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit, spirit prayer, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is what is it being? Question. I will pray with the spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. Else when thou shalt bless with the spirit, how shall he that occupies the room of the unlearned say amen at the giving of thanks, seeing he understandeth not what thou sayest. Verse 17 says, For thou verily givest thanks well, but the other is not edified. I thank you, God, that I speak with tongues more than ye all. Yet in the church I would rather speak five words with my understanding that my voice might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Verse 20, brethren, be not children in understanding, howbeit in malice 
be children, but in understanding, be men. Father God, we thank you for allowing us to be here one more time. <coughs> we thank you, God, and we, we praise you for waking us up this morning and starting us on our way. We thank you for life, health, and we thank you for strength. We thank you for a reasonable portion of health. Father God, as we come now to the point of the service where we break the bread of life, I pray now that you will lift me up into your storehouse of wisdom. You will anoint me from the crown of my head to the sole of my feet. You will give me preaching power from my own heart that I can preach this sermon with power and with clarity. Like John said, let me now decrease while you increase, that they always hear from you and never from me. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. God bless you and thank you as you may be <clears throat> seated in the presence of the Lord. As we uh, continue in our series of sermons that I've entitled Charismatic Chaos, I want us to look at part four and five, breaking down into parts one and two. I want to use for a subject this morning, counterfeit gifts. Counterfeit gifts, part number one. And I believe that one of the most, this is one of the most misunderstood texts in all of the Bible. Satan is the master of imitation. And only what is important is imitating. Now, you, you never see someone take something that's not important and imitate it. If something is imitated, that means it has some substantial value to it for it to be imitated. And I remember, and I was told this a long time ago, when J. Edgar Hoover was the president of the FBI, we had the counterfeit ring, the counterfeit money. And J. Edgar Hoover had a no. different way of teaching. If the money was counterfeit, first of all, he would never let them see a counterfeit dollar, touch a counterfeit dollar. He would make them take the original, touch it, study it, learn it, know it. So when you come in contact with the with an imitation or a phony dollar or twenty dollar bill, you would know it because you know the original so well. We should know the Bible so well that when something comes along and it's out of context or it is wrong, it is an imitation, the devil is trying to fool us, we should know because we know the original that way. I know what the Bible says. I, I've studied the Bible, studied it so that thyself approve upon. Now returning to the question of gifts of, of tongues and prophecy, and he has previously dealt with in chapter 12 the confusion chapter 13 was the correction and now chapter 13 12 13 14 now he deals with the comparison tongues are only mentioned in two books of the bible that is acts and first corinthians over the past several weeks we have studied the subject of tongues chapter 12 13 and 14 makes up uh, a trilogy I call it. It's like a door with the door, the door plate, the door and the hinge. It takes all three parts in order for the door to work correctly. You can't understand chapter 14 if you don't understand chapter 12 and 13. One of the problems that we have in Christendom today, they will take this text out of context, go to chapter 14 and make it say something that it does not say. Remember now this letter is a letter of castigating and condemning the church at Corinth for their activity in the church. It says nothing good. It's nothing that you would want to build a doctrine on because everything is condemning them for their action inside of the church. You must understand that 12 and 13, in, in, in order to understand 14, Paul writes this letter to them for their conduct of the misuse of the gifts in the church. They were a mixed up, messed up church and they desired the gifts of speaking in tongues. A lot of people want to say that this part of salvation is when you say there has to be the evidence of speaking in tongues. There's no way in the Bible 
that says that I need to show evidence of my salvation. The Bible says, if you believe in your heart, confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. There's no other name that a man may call on that a man might be saved in the name of Jesus Christ. It has no bearing on me showing my salvation by, by speaking in tongues. Nowhere in the Bible have I read that someone went to hell because they did not speak in tongues. Chapter 12, again, dealt with the confusion. Chapter 13 dealt with the correction. And now for the next two weeks, we will deal with chapter 14. We'll deal with the comparison uh, part one today. But notice that there's five things I want us to notice in uh, these two weeks. The first thing is the subordination of tongues revealed. The second is the substance of tongues recorded. Thirdly, it's the sign of tongues revealed. Fourthly, it's the speaking in tongues regulated. And fifthly, it's the standard of tongues that is required. But we're only going to deal with point number one and point number two this morning. Three, four, and five, we'll deal with if the Lord's will next week. But look at point number one, the subordination of tongues that is required there in verse number in verse number one. And it says, follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye might prophesy. But notice the priority that's cited there, that they are to pursue, in chapter 12, verse 31, says that they are to pursue love. Love ought to be the number one uh, requirement that we look for instead of just speaking in tongues or just a spiritual gift. We should desire to love one another. A lot of people take that word love out of, out of, out of, out of context. Discipline is born out of love. This is the reason why your parents would say, it hurts me more than it hurts you. As a child, that was I never understood that because I'm the one that's being beaten and you're the one that's doing the beating. I'm the one that's being hurt, but you said it hurts you more than it hurts me. But love is, is, is born out of discipline. You discipline them because you love them. Because if you didn't love them, you wouldn't care. So every time we go out and we witness and we, we try to win someone to Christ, someone may be part of the LGBT, and the first thing they say is we are not practicing love. The reason why I'm here is because I love you. The reason why I'm not at home sitting in my chair watching television is because I think enough of you to come out and share the gospel with you because I, I love you. We are to desire love. There's nothing wrong with, with, with setting one's heart on spiritual gifts, but the highest gift is to speak the message of God. That's the highest gift. They wanted, they wanted all of them wanted the, 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 the tongues. All of them wanted to, to, to speak in tongues. But Paul is saying the highest gift that you can have is to preach, teach the message of God. The Great Commission says, go into all the world with the message of, of, of the gospel. Preach the word power. Paul said it's the power unto salvation. The word has power to, to transform lives. Our message, our uh, mindset is to share or to speak the message of God. The church was chasing after tongues, not edifying the body. They wanted to look spiritual. They, they wanted for people to look at them. Those that speak in tongues, to me, they look more spiritual than, than people like me that just don't speak in tongues. They, they wanted everybody to, to see them. They wanted to feel like they were 10 foot tall while they were speaking in tongues. But tongues is a language. Dialectos, the Greek word where we get the English word dialect, it's a language. Glossolalia is unintelligent gibberish. Paul says that I, I, I prefer that you speak with tongues, dialectos, languages, than to speak with glossolalia, unintelligent speech. When, when, when Peter preached at Pentecost, they said that we hear in our own language. So I don't know if the power was in the speaking or in the hearing, but Paul was speaking and there were different Medes and Persians. It were different groups of people there. But they all said that we heard in our own language, but the hearing 
of God was the edifying that they might come to know Jesus Christ in the pardon of their sin. The reason why they were speaking in tongues so the people that were there can hear about the Lord and come to know him as Christ. That is not what we see in most churches today. It is not the edifying of the body. It may be the edifying of the, the person, but, but not the, the body. But now we, we brought it down the gospel to absolutely nothing. And, and now we get up and we shout and sweat and spit for about 10, 15 minutes and we want to call that preaching. Instead of exegeting the word and preaching the word in context, we've gotten away from that priority and decided, but notice the purpose that's characterized in verse 2 and 3. Tongues don't enlighten the whole church without understanding it's profitable. It is not profitable at all. If you were to speak in tongues, Without an interpreter, it profits the body of Christ nothing. Remember what I said at the very beginning. If a gift is given, it is given for the edification of the whole body. That means everybody it benefits from the gift that God has given. If you are speaking in an unknown language that don't nobody understand, not even yourself, how is the whole body being edified when it can't understand what's being said? That's one of the, the, the signs there that tongues don't enlighten the church as a whole without understanding. But notice the problem of tongues. And it was the purpose of prophecy. And, and, and tongues in unintelligible gibberish or language benefits nobody. If I was to start talking in German or Persian or uh, Spanish or whatever, it benefits uh, none of us unless we know how to speak in that particular language. But he's saying if there is no interpreter, it does not profit the body at all. Maybe he's speaking in the mystery of the spirit. The whole process doesn't make sense to me when you're speaking in a language that no one can understand. If they can't understand it, there's no edification of the body. But the problem of tongue, but notice the purpose of tongues in verse 3. The purpose of prophecy, excuse me, is to build up the body of Christ. When the word is preached correctly, it can transform lives. It convicts. It confronts. When it is preached correctly, Paul says there in verse number three, but he that prophesies speaketh unto to men to edification and exaltation and comfort. Paul is saying that I prefer that you prophesy before you speak in tongues. Because speaking in tongues does not edify, but prophecy edifies and it builds up the body of Christ. The reason why we are here is to be edified by the, the word of, of God. They desired tongues over prophecy. The priority cited the purpose characterized. But notice the purpose commended there in verse 4 and 5. It's unreal to God. They only bring glory to themselves. What is done in a local church should be done to profit all. Let me say that again. What is done in the church is to profit all in the church. So whatever gifts is given, whether it's prophecy, whether it's tongues, if there was a, tongues were legitimate at one time, but once the, the completion of the Bible was completed, the Bible says that in and of itself, tongues cease. There's no need for tongues if we have the canonized scripture of, of the Bible. But notice the preface that's commended. There's three things that I want us to notice. First of all, it's pride. Verse number four, he, he that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifies himself. That's pride. It's an it's a ego builder. For those that speak in tongues, you ever notice that there is only certain times that they speak in tongues and when they speak in tongues they, they, they have this theatrical uh, display as they lay hands on folks and they say it and everybody goes crazy because that's an ego built. Pride is, is built. Look at me. It feels good when you 
speaking in tongues and everybody is envying you, everybody is, is looking at you, that's pride, but it's also in, ver in prophecy in verse 5, but I would ye all speak with, with tongues, but rather ye would prophesy, for greater is he that prophesy than he that speaketh in tongues, except, here's the exception, that he interpret that the church may receive edification. If you're going to speak in tongues, you need a person to interpret what was saying so the body can be edified. If there's no interpreter, it is unprofitable for the body. But he said, but I prefer that you prophesy. I'd rather you speak with, with, with tongues. There are tongues. That word there is delect. That's why word study is so important. I know it's rigorous is tedious but you have to do a word study so you can understand what is tongue tongues and unknown tongues there's three words there you have to understand in context which word paul is using the let us a gloss a little he said i would rather you speak in the let us languages but not all gifts are given to to one person it is spread out throughout the body his preference was, was prophecy was sharing the good news. Paul said, if you want to desire anything, prophecy should be number uno on the list that we share the message of the gospel because Paul said, it's the power unto salvation. Faith coming by hearing and hearing coming by the word of God. The only way you can be saved is that you have to hear the word of God. The pride, the prophecy, notice the prerequisite there. It said that you interpret what you're saying to profit the church. This is the prerequisite. If you're going to speak in tongues in the church, someone has to be there to interpret it. So if God gives you the gift to speak in tongues, mm -hmm. God will also give someone to understand what was said to edify the body. The body because it, it does not benefit the body if I can't understand what's been what's been said. Amen. Verse 28. Look at this. Jump on to verse 28. Let me read this and you're going to keep on trusting. But if there is no interpreter, let him keep silent in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. Let me read it again because y'all missed it. Mm -hmm. If someone speaks in tongues, verse 28 says, but if there's no interpreter, let him remain silent in the church. I think that, I, I don't know about you, but I don't think it get any clearer than that. So if you are to speak in tongues, and you see a lot of churches, that not only one, two, three, four, five, six, seven people are all speaking in tongues at one time with no interpreter. The Bible said if no one is there, shut up. <laughs> And then it said, if they are, you have to do it one at a time. Because you have to speak and, and interpret. Speak and interpret. It has to be an interpreter there. If it says, if it's not, then you're not to, to say anything. The prior to citing the purpose characterized, the preference commended. But notice, point D, sub point D, the prophet challenged there in verse 6 through 10. Paul here challenges the benefits of tongue. There must be understanding in communication. Everybody understand that, right? There, there must be understanding in communication. Now, if you can't understand, there's a, there's a breakdown, but there has to be understanding. The preach word communicated in verse number six, and it says, now, brethren, if I, if, if I come unto you Speaking with tongues, that shall that shall I profit you, except I shall speak to you either by revelation, by knowledge, or by prophecy, or by or by or by doctrine. The preached word communicated there under the prophet's challenge it is profitless if it's not understandable. Who could understand a word that was said? And all it benefits the body when it's understood and the true revelation of God is preached. 
Glossolalia has no value in the church. Glossolalia, that means unintelligent gibberish. That's what babies do. They babble when, they, when they're learning how to talk. If you listen to some of these folks in churches, it sounds like your baby is babbling. But there, there's no edification. There's no, there's no understanding. Remember, tongues was a sign gift. And the gifts were to unbelievers, not believers. So here's the rub. If it's for unbelievers, then why are you even speaking in tongues in the church from the beginning? Because the church is classified as a group of baptized believers. So tongues are to edify are for the unbelievers, not the believers. So why are we even speaking in tongues in church anyway? But since it was a sign gift, and it went away in and of itself with the completion of, 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 of the Bible, the preached word that's communicated is profitless if you don't understand it. The play sound communicated, notice there's a distinction in sound. Each instrument makes a dis distinct sound. Otherwise, all that is produced is noise. There, I don't know how many of y'all played in the, in the band before, played a musical. Um, instrument, there, there's laws that govern music. There's choruses, there's keys, there's timing, there's a conductor that rules all. But what if each player went his own way regardless of the rules? Instead of a symphony, you will have a concoction. A, a symphony sounds good. It's pleasing. So the opposite of a symphony is a cacophony, which that means that everything is out of tune, out of order, and it sounds horrible. What if, what if you had the, the orchestra, they come and everybody sat down and they just started to play whatever they wanted to play? It would sound like a bunch of, uh, of noise. Uh, I guess that's right. But every instrument, there's a distinct sound that is made. But not only the distinction, but notice the definite sound. Verse 8. Centuries ago, commands were given by a trumpet to go into battle, to retreat, and to wake up. I remember in the Navy. Every morning you hear da 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 You know exactly what that means. That means get up. And they would say, Wear the uniform of the day is wear a peak coat. Wear a watch coat. They would tell you exactly what to wear. But when you hear that, 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 you hear the trumpet sound in the morning, it made a distinct sound, and you knew it was time to get up. You can't roll over and hit the snooze button and say, I need five more minutes. When you heard that trumpet, when that trumpet stops trumpeting, you had better be on your feet. Put the clothes on, getting prepped, getting ready to, to, to go. But it makes a distinct sound. The watchman will stand on the tower. And, and I remember growing up, my grandmother loved westerns. I was sit there, I didn't care for them that much back then, but since she liked them, I would sit there and, and watch her. My, my favorite was two mules for Sister Sarah. Y'all don't know anything about, about westerns. But what they had was, they, they had the, the watchman. And this describes that the pastors are the ones that preach the word. He sat on the tower, he had a panoramic view of the area, and he could see the enemy coming for miles. And what he would do when he saw the enemy, he would blow the trumpet, and immediately the people recognized the sound of the trumpet and knew that meant danger is coming. The responsibility of the pastor is to, to preach the word, to warn them that danger is, is coming. The sounds are, are distinct. The trumpet means to go into battle, to retreat, to wake up. If the sounds were unclear, you wouldn't know what to do. If, the, if I didn't hear that, 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 if I didn't hear that and I heard something else, then I would be confused as to what I'm supposed to. Am I supposed to get up? Am I supposed to stand? And, and if, what exactly am I supposed to do? There's a distinction in sounds. So what's happening in the Corinthian church? Just like languages, if there's no clear understanding, it does not profit the hearers. There has to be 
a clear understanding. I can't stress that enough that we come here, we, we hear the word, and faith cometh by hearing, and hearing cometh by the word of God. That all cometh by understanding of what we what we hear. But notice the proclaimed communication there, verse 9 through 11. That's pretty blunt as he's saying. There are many languages, but none of them are, are, are without understanding. There's many languages, but none of them are without understanding. There must be clarity and understanding of words. In order for me to communicate with my wife or communicate with, with my children or communicate with, with my grandson, that there has to be words. Yeah. I mean, you, you have to communicate. I have to give a statement or a sentence. And there must be understanding. There must be a reply to a command. There has to be understanding. He refers to them as, as, as barbarians. A barbarian, verse 11, it says, Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto them that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. A barbarian is just a person that you would, you would see out in the woods that was uneducated, didn't know how to speak English, didn't know how to do anything. He was, he's a barbarian. He's, and the word there means inferior. But when you use it like that, it says someone that's, that's not intelligent, that, that maybe live out in, in the woods like Bigfoot, if there is such a person. Bigfoot would be a barbarian to me. Yeah, I know he don't exist, but I'm making a point. He would be a, a barbarian. He's someone that lives out with no education, no understanding. That's what he, he's saying. But what happens in the church, in the tongues, talk is up today, does not make sense for you to stand up in a church and speak in the language that does not edify the church and also you don't understand. So you're speaking in the language the church nor you understands what it means because if you understood it then you would need an interpreter. You can interpret what you said yourself but you're going to speak in a language that you don't understand neither does the church and you think that's a good thing. Then on top of that it's eight of y'all doing it at the same time. The pride that's commended. Their motivation is to desire the gifts must be right. I, I don't desire the office of a bishop or a pastor for sure. I don't do this to be recognized. I don't do this so I can feel like I'm, I'm 10 foot tall. I do this because God has commanded me to do it. But whatever we do, we do it for the right reason. Mm -hmm. You have people with these praise teams and these, these choirs, they, they have a knockout, drag out fights because somebody wants to lead and they don't think that they need to lead. I want to lead all the songs every, you know, that ought to be a, a purpose, a desire in what we do and it ought not be for show, but for the edification of the body. They was zealous to, to look spiritual. And every time I see someone get up and they're preaching all of a sudden they break out and their their, their, their tongues they to me like they want to look spiritual. They they desire to be seen to be to be noticed but Paul said I desire that you prophesy that that we come to church and that we learn something. So when I walk, you walk out of here, I hate for somebody to say, well, Pastor Shaw preached good today. What did he preach about? I don't know, but he was good. How can he be good? And you don't know. I mean, that, that doesn't make sense. The counterfeit, the subordination of tongues, and lastly, is the substance of tongues that is recorded in verse 13 through 20. But notice the prescription for tongues there. First of all, there's the principle. Verse 13 says, Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayer, but my understanding is unfruitful. But notice the principle there. If you speak it, there should be someone who can interpret 
what you seen in order that it may be understandable for the church. Verse 5. Go back to verse 5. And it says, I would have that ye all spoke with tongues, but rather that ye prophesied. For greater is he that prophesied than he that speaketh in tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edification. I know I know it sounds a little, a little redundant, but I, 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 I made it that way because I want you to understand that when the gift is given, it's for the edification of the body. Once the body is not edified by the gift, then the gift is not used properly. It is not just for me. And notice there, the problem is, he says, when he pray in the spirit, to what end question, the spirit prays, but his reasoning is bypassed. So that means that when you pray in the spirit, it, it overlooks or uh, uh, jumps over your brain. So the, the, the spirit detaches itself from the body, obviously, because I don't know how you can, you can pray in the spirit, but it jumps over the brain. There, it, it overlooks the reasoning. So you're praying in the spirit, but you don't understand what you're saying. Whatever you do, you get understanding. He's speaking and does not understand. And it is unprofitable for him. People will say, Pastor, I know what I experienced. I know what I experienced. Like the lady said that I forgot it was one either buying them one off. The guy took the jacket off. She put on the jacket and she felt the anointing in the jacket. <laughs> Pastor, you don't know I experienced this. Well, I don't know what you think you experienced, but you didn't experience that. Because the Holy Spirit is not going to be in a jacket. You may have felt something. Maybe some of you did last night, but that, that's, not, that's not true. But, you, you know, people say, well, you don't know what I experienced. I experienced speaking in, in, in tongues. You know, after the second and third admonition, then you just leave it, you leave it, you leave it alone. The principle, the problem, and notice the proposition in it. If you're going to, to say, look at verse 15, verse 16, let me read this to you. It says, what then? What, what then? Verse 15, what then? I will pray with the Spirit I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. Else when thou shalt bless with the spirit, how shall he that occupies the room of the unlearned say amen at the giving of thanks, seeing he understandeth not what they what they say. If you're going to sing, make sure your reasoning is part of the process. You know, you know, you don't get up and just sing in the spirit, but the spirit bypasses the mind and something comes out of your mouth. So if you sing, I sing with understanding. When I pray, I pray with understanding. When I preach, I preach with understanding. I can't preach or pray and it bypasses the faculties of my mind and I don't know what I'm saying. You know, to me that's scary. For you to say I'm praying to God, but I, you know, I don't know what I just said. You may have said, why it's got to be good. Could have been bad. You don't know. When God strike you down, you'll find out then. But notice it's purposefully. Unfruitful. It bears no spiritual fruit. If you can't understand what it said, it's, it's unfruitful. It's powerless without meaning. It's powerless without understanding. Without understanding, it profited us nothing. How 
can an unlearned man say amen? Now the word amen means in the military we say I concur. I concur. It means I, I, I understand. So every time I say something that you are in agreement with, you should say amen. Amen. Now, when, 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 I, when I say something that you're in agreement with, you say, Amen. So how can the unlearned, the unsaved, unregenerate person say, I concur, if he can't understand what's being said? How can he say, Amen? How can he say, I agree? With anything, if there's no uh, understanding tone, at that time was, was was valid. There was a time that tongues were were valid. It was what we called a assigned gift. The gift was to identify that the person and the message is from God. There was no Bible. We didn't have a canonized scripture. We didn't have sixty six books in a leather binder. There was no Bible then. So in order for me to validate who I was, I could do miracles. And one of the miracles that was given is tongues. Tongues is not something that you learn, it's something that you're given. If I was to go to Japan, and, and God said, I want you to preach to the Japanese, and I said, Lord, you know, goodness well, I can't, I don't know Japanese. And all of a sudden, by miracle, God gives me the ability to speak in the language. But here's the purpose that they might hear that they might be saved. Wherever you go around the world, if you can speak in a language that they can come to know Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord, that's the proper context of tongues. It is a gift that is given to the person that he did not learn it or know it. God gave it to him, but the purpose was for the edifying of the body. That's the purpose of tongues. Not what we see today in churches that mumbo jumbo jumping over the building, leaping over the building and over the pews, and everyone wants to speak in some kind of unecstatic others and babbling like no baby. What happened if someone coming in off the street, you guys are speaking it like baby, he would think that y'all crazy in here. You may. If a person was to walk in and see folks around here babbling like they, because when they, I'm almost done, I got one more point, two more points to so, When the Corinthians came into the knowledge of, of salvation, you know, like my wife said, everybody have a past. The, the, the past was that they would get at the foot of Diana, which was a goddess. And this was the one that had 100 breasts. And they would get down at the foot of Diana under the auspices, the control of the devil. They would have orgies, froth at the mouth, and they would speak in unintelligent utterances. As if you're under the control of the devil. You ever seen the exorcist and when they, they began to mumble something? They said, when they came into the church, they saw them speaking in tongue and language and they said, hey, I can do that too. Mm. They brought their background from paganism into the church and they began to say, hey, I can speak in tongues too. And they brought the babbling that they did by the control of the devil into the church. The practice challenged there in verse 18 and 18. Paul says that he speak with delectos languages but notice the personal experience there verse 18 i thank my god i speak with tongues more than you all paul says i speak in more languages than you see they'll take this text out of context and say that paul says i speak in tongues more than you all not not this unintelligible speech but paul says i can speak in more languages than all of you. 
We have to make sure we have good understanding of the word. He's castigating them and he's condemning them. He's not complimenting them or building them up, but he's tearing them down for what they were doing in, in inside of the, the church. Paul said, I speak with the lextos. That which is, is known versus the unknown. Paul is referring to languages. He says, I'm thankful I can speak to you all. As Paul traveled all over the world, the known world, Paul was able to communicate to them in the language in which they spoke. But not all of the languages were learned by Paul. God gave him the the miracle ability to speak in those languages. So Paul is saying, I speak in more dialect, more dialects than you. We got a lot of people, uh, like I said, post office, got a lot of Filipinos. We got those that speak Spanish, those that speak Tagalog. I thought Tagalog and Spanish were the same thing, but they like sister type languages. Like, I guess is hola, hola, hola in Spanish and Tagalog is. Yeah, I know. Yeah, hola, hola. But, you know, but they're, they're different. But, but they, they, they get in a group, in the locker room, and they begin to speak in tongues because they begin to speak in their language to one another. And that's what tongues mean. It, I, I can't understand what they're, they're, they're saying, but they can understand exactly what makes me a little tense is. I don't know what they're saying. They could be talking about me in my face, and I, I'm not even. You know, and they, they, they do that because you, you don't know who know what language. And they were speaking Spanish, and the guys were there, and then the guy chuckled. And uh, I said, well, what's funny? He said, no, I, heard, I was just listening to what they were saying. <laughs> they didn't know. He knew what they were saying because they looked at him and said, that, you know, he looked like me, but he knew Spanish. But they didn't think so. And they were talking, and he just was chuckling and said, don't worry about it. I'll tell you about it. And they were actually were saying some things that they should not be saying in that <laughs> environment. But they assumed that nobody would, would know. But that's 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 tongues, that's, that's languages. But notice the practical expression. It was more important to teach the body than to impress them with your gifts. It was more important to teach the body of Christ than for me to stand up here and try to impress you with my gifts. And that's what a lot of preachers do. They just, they just trying to impress upon you the gift that they've been given to, to preach. Instead of using the syllables in the right order, they change the syllables. They just want to be seen. They just want to be. But we are to use it for the edification of God. Paul says in verse 19, I would rather speak five words in your understanding than 10,000 that no one can understand. Verse 19, yet in the church, I rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Paul said, I would, rather, I would rather speak five words that you can understand than stand up here and speak 10,000 words that no one understands. The problem that's communicated, verse 20, and I close with this, the problem is pride and childish behavior. To me, it's childish. When someone comes up and tries to showboat, tries to impress somebody with, with their, 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 their gift, the problem is, is pride and childish behavior. Paul begins to tell them to grow up and be men. And Paul said, when I, when I was a child, I, I, I spake as a child. But when I became a, a man, I put away childish things. While wow, man, all this babbling and all this wanting to be on top, that's what children do. Children always want, want everything they, 
they see children are, are selfish. That's the way children are born into the world. But when you become a man, you put away childish thing, childish behavior. When it comes to matters of pride, you should be innocent. But when it comes to understanding, we should be men. I can't express enough the fact of how important it is to understand what's being said. It does no good if I was to preach in a language that no one understood. Not even me, and I remember Ivy Hilliard. You know, ever since we got rid of our direct TV, I don't, I don't know why I don't, don't, don't see him that much anymore. Um, I mean, Hilliard, he's a very popular uh, preacher, and Hilliard said, you know, I was, I was praying in, in the spirit, and he said, I was praying, and I don't know what I said. I almost ran a car off the road, and I said to myself, well, you better know what you're saying. Because when we pray, we pray with the faculties of our mind. When we sing, we sing with the faculties of our mind. And when we prophesy, we prophesy with our mind that we know what it is we're preaching, we're teaching, we're saying, and what we're saying. There's no way humanly possible I can speak in a holy language. That nowhere in the Bible does it say there's a holy language. There's nowhere in the Bible does it say the angels have their own language. But people want to be spiritual when they say that I speak in the in the in the in the language of angels. That sounds good, though. If I was to tell you that, that makes me sound good. I speak in the language of angels. Makes me sound good. But what I want to get out of this is we'll pick up with part two. We'll conclude um, the tongue moving. You know, it's five sermons for one subject. So that lets you know that you can't just go to one chapter and one verse and pluck it out. You've got to understand chapters 12 and 13 for you to begin to understand 14. So it takes five sermons in order to understand one subject of tongues. Amen? Amen. Amen and amen. amen. If the Lord's will and the creek don't rise, part